go. Design Night Explorer, what do you think about that, huh? Not bad. Look at all you explorers out there. What a great time we are going to have tonight. Thank you all so much for coming once again to Design Night. How many of you have been to a Design Night before? Wow. Fabulous. We uh, have several of our speakers from past Design Nights. As a matter of fact, uh, we have a couple who were here just speaking last year. How many of you came to the one we did on oceans a year ago? What would you think of that one, huh? Well, we have Leslie Ewing and we have Erica Bergman, two of our speakers from that event. Sylvia Earl would have been here tonight to join us, but Sylvia is off at a National Geographic Explorer meeting. And so she wasn't able to, uh, she wasn't able to join us. But we're glad that you did, and uh, we know that each and every one of you is, in fact, uh, an explorer. And so in addition to the Design Night hashtag tonight, why don't we use this one as well? Hashtag explore. If you're out there in social media, you're pushing some of this stuff, let's, uh, let's see if we can own that tonight here at Design Night. Does that sound good? Excellent. Well, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Jonathan Knowles, and I, uh, thank you, two of them out there. Uh, I, uh, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Brian. <laughs> there we go. Uh, I work here in the office of the Chief Technology Officer, and it is certainly a pleasure to be your uh, host and one of your speakers tonight for this design night. Uh, before I get started, I just have to say, didn't the team that puts together Design Night every month do just a fabulous job tonight? Thank you, Grace and Jason and your teams, Becca and Aviva. All of, all of you did such a great job, and we're so appreciative uh, of it. Um, I just did get back from this trip. I'm going to go ahead and take this jacket off now. Uh, this was a trip we did up to, uh, well, 300 miles north of the Arctic Circle, and uh, it got cold. It got minus 80 degrees cold. That's cold. Yeah, that's Minnesota cold. That's how cold that is. So uh, we'll talk a little bit more about why we were up there doing that trip uh, uh, a little later. So when you think about explorers, how many people think of this? Right? Yeah. That's that thing I learned. Uh, there was the age of exploration. That was a thing that happened at some point in history. And uh, yeah, Magellan and uh, all those guys uh, did their thing. Captain Cook, right? Uh, I think that's what a lot of people think about when they think about explorers. No, some people, they think about our good friend Sylvia Earle, Dr. Sylvia Earle, National Geographic Explorer, uh, uh, oceanographer uh, extraordinaire. Uh, some people think about our good friend, uh, Dr. Buzz Aldrin, who, how many were you, of you were here for our space design night we did, right? You might remember we had Buzz telephone in a welcome to you all. He was on the East Coast and couldn't join us. But Buzz uh, did telephone in, and that's our good friend Buzz. And then, of course, some people think about people like this. I don't think you know this one. This is Dr. Francis Thackeray. He is at the University of Witzwaterrand in South Africa, where they work to explore the origins of our humanity. Some of the oldest human fossils found are found at their dig sites just outside of Johannesburg. Uh, so lots of different things around explore and what it means. And, we all think of uh, different things when we think of exploration, and some of us think of the tools of exploration looking something like this. But that's a big bit old school. Uh, in fact, today's tools are quite different. They're tools such as Autodesk Memento, uh, which we have on display out here for you, a little thing for you to try yourself. So when you're done in here, we have a bunch of different activities, including a Memento activity that will allow you to do what we call reality capture, to take things from the real world and turn them into 3D models that you can do things like this with, or 3D print. So we have a selection of those on a table that you can interact with and check out, um, and we want you to make your own. And even if you don't make them uh, here tonight, go home and check out, do a Google search on Autodesk Memento and be absolutely amazed at what you can do. And you're gonna see some examples of what some people are doing, some explorers are doing with Memento a little later on. Uh, we have another activity here. You get to explore Mars a little. Now, you're not really getting to take the iPad and control the Mars Curiosity rover. Uh, that happens, of course, at JPL. But we have built Mars uh, somewhere here in the building, sort of. Uh, it was funny earlier. Uh, one of us said, hey, is Mars working? Still getting our head around that. Uh, but you get to drive the rover around Mars yourselves and see what it's like to control something with a little bit of a lag that's in a different location. Keep in mind when you're doing that that Mars Curiosity rover has about an eight-minute lag, I think it is, when you're driving it around. So it's a little different for those guys. There's an activity here for sundials, 
go make your own sundials that are uh, calibrated here for this particular longitude and latitude. Make your own uh, Egyptian hieroglyphic badges out there and learn a little bit about hieroglyphs. Uh, uh, do the tent building competition. And all this happens after this as well. Some of you have already been doing these activities, but they'll go on afterwards. Um, and the tent building competition is hilarious. So even if you don't get in it, go watch it and be absolutely entertained at what these guys do. We have a reproduction of the Rosetta Stone out here for you to check out. If you don't know what it is, you absolutely should learn a little bit about it, read about what we have written there, and then go do your own research and just uh, and be amazed at the fact that we have a reproduction of the one that's in the British Museum. Uh, we also have uh, Mike Regala has done some interesting work here. Mike's a great guy. He's a good friend. Uh, you might have read a story about some folks who uh, went out and potentially scanned uh, the Nefertiti statue in a museum in Germany covertly and released it to the world because it's kind of a big deal that Germany has this statue from Egypt. And so Mike took that data, put it into Memento, and actually 3D printed some little uh, Nefertiti statues. So uh, Mike's in the room here. Mike, just wave your hand so people can see you. Go talk to him about what he did. He's one of the Autodesk uh, artists in residence here. We'll pass this one around. Thanks, Jason. For, uh, for people to see. Uh, we also have, uh, these. this is great. These things are soy, dairy, grain, and gluten-free. So we have a few of these for people. So if you're in costume, we might walk up to you and say, great costume, and, uh, and give you one of these. They are made with cricket flour. Uh, this is one of the future foods for the world here. But the folks at EXO uh, sent those along for you to try tonight. And of course, photography by Grant Atwell. Grant, where are you? He's right there. Get your pictures taken by Grant, and he's going to put all these up, and we'll put them up on social media, and uh, check them out at grantatwell.com, uh, and let's remember tonight with his photos. Right, one week. It takes him about a week to get them all up. So why are we doing Explore? Design Night, let it, let's explore. Well, that's because we firmly believe, we passionately believe, that the age of exploration is not a thing that happened a long time ago, that in fact, that technology is allowing for new domains to explore, new ways to explore, and creating new explorers. We hope you believe that too as well. Now some of you might genetically think you're an explorer. There are some people who say that there's an explorer gene. That this particular gene, DRD47R, is the explorer gene. Uh, and there's some research to indicate out that that might be a thing that caused some of those people in Africa to move out of Africa. So maybe you have that gene. And speaking of exploration at that level, uh, have you heard of a thing called the Zika virus? So scientists recently figured out, just last week, the structure of the Zika virus. And what you're looking at here is uh, Autodesk's uh, Molecule Viewer software, which is a free thing you can go online and check out yourself and start exploring these kinds of things at that level. And of course, when you can do things like that in software in 3D, you can do things like 3D print your viruses as well. So we have a 3D printed virus here, if you're interested in checking that out. Uh, this is the reason I was up in the Arctic Circle. These will be the first vehicles that are fossil fuel free to transit Antarctica. We took them up to 300 miles north of the Arctic Circle, put 1,000 miles on them uh, to test them before sending them up to Antarctica. They run on biofuel, diesel, uh, biofuel electric uh, hybrid engines. Uh, the motor is actually uh, electric, and they have a biofuel generator that makes them go done by a whole set of volunteers who use Autodesk technologies to create these things from the ground up, certainly fall into the category of explorers. How about this guy, my friend Sam Crossman? Sam's not an explorer in the true sense, or old sense, I guess, of the word. Uh, Sam was a guy who just had a job and uh, decided to go out and start doing things like this and started flying things like drones into volcanoes. And now Sam does this full time. Uh, using technology that's now accessible and available to him. This is our good friend Louise Leakey, who we've worked with for several years right now to create something amazing called AfricanFossils.org. Louise is part of the Leakey family from East Africa. They've made all these fossils available online for anybody to have access to and download and 3D print so now any classroom in the world can actually have access to these fossils that they're finding and do a pretty darn, yeah, <laughs> there we go. Brian Matthews, our group chief technology officer here, uh, uh, just reminded me of the Crystal Skull. I actually like that movie. Okay, don't get angry. Okay. So Louise, we have a display out there for you to go check that out 
as well, the AfricanFossils.org display. This is our friend uh, Sly Lee. Sly's not a, a biologist, but Sly is using these technologies to go underwater and help better understand what's going on with our coral reefs. He's helping to explore our oceans. Uh, we know there's a problem with coral reefs. This technology is allowing us to understand a lot better than ever before what is happening to these reefs and track them over time. Very, very powerful stuff. Brendan Foley, archaeologist at Wood, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. Um, he is responsible for diving what is the King Tut's tomb of underwater archaeology, something called the Antikythera. That's a mouthful for you. They go underwater. Uh, it's very deep, 240 feet. Uh, an amazing story here. They found a particular thing in the water. They brought it up to the top, and it disintegrated. But before they brought it up to the top, it's 2,300 years old, they did our reality capture on it in the water. So even though it disintegrated, we actually managed to get a computable model of it using this memento technology I mentioned earlier. And because it's a computable model, we were able to print it and create a bronze version of bronze. So what I have here in my hand is a bronze version, bronze version of the thing that disintegrated once it was brought up to the top. That's how powerful this stuff is in preserving our cultural heritage. Speaking of the Antikythera, uh, this is Marcos. Mark, uh, one of the things found in the Antikythera wreck in Greece was the Antikythera mechanism. There's a fabulous display on it at the Computer <laughs> History Museum down in Mountain View. It's considered to be the world's oldest computer. This is what it looked like when they took it out of the water. Didn't know what it was. Found it a little over 100 years ago. Did some x-rays on it. Realized it was a bunch of gears inside. Marcos took that information and using Autodesk Fusion 360 created a replica of the Antikythera mechanism, the world's oldest computer. Uh, he even, this is, I love this part, he's even now created a game based on the parts of the Antikythera so you can take them apart, put them together, and actually learn how to do programming the way Archimedes would have learned how to do programming 2,300 years ago. Fascinating stuff. We have people like Planet Labs. You'll hear a little bit more about them later. They launch inexpensive satellites up into the air now, and that's opening up a whole new world of space archaeology, allowing people, anybody, to have access to data, to this information from these satellites uh, on a daily basis, fresh daily uh, information uh, from Planet Labs. So totally opening up uh, the world of exploration um, from space here on planet Earth. Well, now let's, uh, let's take a little shift back and let's talk about our future off-world and exploring beyond planet Earth. It was just uh, not too long ago that we first got off this rock as a species, and in some of our lifetimes that happened. And uh, a very, very good friend of mine is our next speaker, and he's going to talk a little bit about our off-world future. And while it may not be exactly like this, and this is what uh, another friend of mine who is... Uh, lives in the town I live in, down in Los Gatos. Uh, Rick uh, Gudice? Rick Gaitis, thank you. That's my wife. Thank you, Rick Gaitis. Uh, he, he, NASA commissioned him in the 1970s to draw what our future space habitats would look like. Uh, and my very, very good friend, Jason Dunn, the CTO and one of the founders of Made in Space, is now going to come up and tell us a little bit about how to think about our off-world future, and the future of space exploration. So Jason, come on up. All right. Well, thanks for that awesome introduction, Jonathan. Uh, yeah, look at those socks. That's what David was saying. <laughs> Uh, so this is not actually in space. This is in uh, a zero-gravity airplane where we get to simulate space, or at least microgravity, and uh, you fly in an airplane's flying these parabolic maneuvers, and for about 20 seconds, you float, and then another 20 seconds, you're two times your weight, and you go back and forth like a roller coaster. So that's a lot of fun. So what, um, what I want to talk about is how there's a lot of new technologies that are, Jonathan mentioned a lot of them, that are really coming online that haven't been around even five or ten years ago that are allowing us to explore space differently than we've ever explored space before. And uh, to start, this is how we explore space today. We're a lot like the goldfish in a goldfish bowl. Uh, we bottle up Earth 
like the picture of Buzz Aldrin, we have, he wears a little bit of earth around his head. We bottle up earth and we bring it with us wherever we want to go, and that's what keeps us alive in space. And the trick is that if we want to really live in space, if we want to go to Mars one day or maybe build a home in the asteroid belt, we have to become independent of Earth. We have to somehow become um, Earth independent, if you will. But today, it's a lot like the goldfish bowl. It's cramped. It's uncomfortable. It's not how we imagine space to be. It's not 2001, a space odyssey. It's cramped. It's not, it's not these wonderful pictures of this idea of building entirely new worlds in space that humans could one day live in. So to understand this problem, and it's what, what I've been doing for, um, for, I guess, as long as I've been doing work, uh, <laughs> um, it, you, have to, you have to go back to where we started. And we started, actually, we, we celebrate the anniversary of the first human in space in five days. And it'll be the 55th anniversary. So we've been going to space for over a half of a century now. And the first flight was Yuri Gagarin, 1961, on April 12th. And how did he get to space? It was a, the crowning achievement of technology at the time. It was called the Volstock rocket. And this got him into space suborbital. He went up, looked at Earth, and he came back down a short while later. Now we fast forward 55, 55 years later, and look at how any astronaut gets into space today. This is Butch Wilmore, and pick any astronaut that's going up. It's the same story. Butch went to space in 2014, and I'll talk about him in a moment. How did Butch get into space? He went on a Soyuz rocket. <laughs> almost, they almost look the same, right? And they really are almost exactly the same rocket. The Soyuz, the Russian-built Soyuz, has been in service since 1967. So about six years after the very first person went into space, we started flying the same rocket that we're still flying today. And that's really the issue that, that space exploration has. It's why I'm pretty sure nobody in this room has ever been into space, is because we've always gone into space on a rocket. It's chemical propulsion. It's the same technology. And what, what it comes down to is that to, we all sit at the bottom of what we call Earth's gravity well, this, this pit that you, takes a tremendous amount of energy to get out of. So only about 2% of a rocket is the thing we want in space. The other 98% is the structure and the fuel and all the mechanisms of that rocket that get that 2% there. So it takes a lot of energy. The Apollo astronauts were traveling 10 times the speed of a rifle bullet to escape the gravitational pull of Earth. And in fact, anything we've ever sent outside of Earth's gravitational pull has had to go that fast. 10 times the speed of a rifle bullet. Think about that. So about five and a half years ago, my friends and I were thinking about that problem and, you know, how can we actually set us on a new course so that we can really, so anybody here can go into space one day. And what we recognize is everybody was thinking about this problem of rockets. How do we make a rocket better, faster, cheaper, reusable? We're seeing a lot of reusable rockets right now. But we asked a fundamentally different question. We said, what if we didn't have to launch anything at all? What if, in fact, one day, anything in space could be made in space, hence the name. And that's what we started working on. And I'll share one of my favorite stories so far. So we, we now actually, Made in Space has two 3D printers on the space station. We've had one there since the fall of 2014. And just two weeks ago, our second generation printer made it up to the space station. We're really happy about that. Thank you. Um, what's, one thing that's really great about the second one is, well, it's bigger, badder, better in every way, but it actually has memento uh, capability inside. So not only can we 3D print in space, but we can, we can do reality capture of everything that we build, and we can understand what we're building. So here's a story about Butch. I mentioned him earlier. He's on the space station in December of 2014, and he calls us, and he says he lost his ratchet. I imagine like a, a wrench, a, a torque ratcheting tool. He says he lost his ratchet. Maybe that's hard to believe, but think about this is what the space station looks like. It's a cluttered, compact, you know, tuna can in space, and things, everything's floating. So when I'm in zero gravity in the airplane, I learned that all too well, but it would be very easy to lose something like a ratchet. Maybe it floated in that spacesuit. So we control the printer from the ground in our office down the road in Mountain View, and we actually get to work with the astronauts as we print things. But the interesting thing is that for the astronauts, it's this 
magical box in space where they don't actually know what will be inside of it when they, take the, when they open the door. It's just there's a, there's a part, they take it out, they close the door, the next time they come up, there's a new part inside. So it's this magical experience for them. One day Butch mentions he's missing his ratchet. So we work with NASA to design a ratchet <coughs> for Butch. And NASA said, you know, it needs to have it needs to have uh, you know, moving parts like a ratchet mechanism, but no assembly required. But should be able to take it out of the printer and, and it should be ready to use. And it needs to be torque rated and we need to know how much torque it can take. It needs to have smooth edges so it doesn't, he can't cut himself on it. And we worked through all those challenges with NASA. They actually did safety qualification. Of, they, they held a 3D printed ratchet on the ground, which was the first time they would ever hold something that wasn't the real thing going into space, but more of a representation of what we would 3D print. And they qualified it, and about five days later, from Butch asking for a ratchet, we got to print him a ratchet. So this is the, the printer, um, it's that metal box inside of the big glass box, and uh, it's, so it's about the size of a small microwave oven. And we, we basically email hardware to space. So we take the digital file created in actually Fusion 360, and we, we email it to this laptop computer, where then we remote desktop into that computer. It's, I mean, it's a little more tricky than remote desktop, but it's about <laughs> like remote desktop. And we send that file to the printer, we hit print. And the, the amazing thing is it took five days to get to that point where we print, but the moment we send the command of the file to the printer, hit print, um, it takes two hours to get this ratchet printed. And, um, Here's Butch uh, coming over to open the door. The last time we even heard from Butch was five days before this picture was taken when he said, I wish I had a ratchet. He has no idea what's inside the box. And um, my favorite picture, uh, happy Butch. And this is right after he got the ratchet out of the printer. Um, so what's amazing about this, this picture is it was taken only two hours after we sent the digital information to the 3D printer. Two hours later and there's hardware in the astronaut's hand. And if Butch were on Mars, it's like the same story. It's the same, it, we're sending things basically at the speed of light. We're sending hardware <laughs> at the speed of light. And, um, and that's really the amazing thing behind what this new technology of, of digital manufacturing allows us to do. So when we look forward and what Made in Space is really excited about is that we can start to think about building things in space that you could never launch. We call them unlaunchable structures or unlaunchable spacecraft, things that are too big to fit into a rocket, right? Or maybe too fragile, they would, they would uh, break under the extreme loads that a rocket sees. Uh, this is, these, you can see three satellites connected by probably a 100 meter long, um, you know, 300 foot long uh, giant truss so you could have uh, stereoscopic imagery of the planet as you fly overhead. And you can't do that today because you can't launch a 300 foot long sparse, optimized design trust. So what we're looking at is the fact that we can actually build something in space that literally can only ex exist in space, where you can build a big, whimsical structure that never has to see gravity. It can, it's zero gravity its whole life. It only can exist in space or in software we, where we design it. So right now we're working with some, some of the folks at Autodesk to design structures that literally can only exist inside of Autodesk software and space. And that's really, really cool to me because then we get to start to look at the most optimized design. The, let space design the structure for us and come out with something that we would have never thought about. There's no textbook on space structures that would ever tell you that this is the right way to do it. And now going forward to where, we, where we're headed, what we're really looking at is how to make Space exploration, Earth independent. That's what I mentioned in the beginning. It's to escape from the fishbowl and to, uh, to really go to space independently from Earth. One of my favorite quotes, and I'll end on, is um, from Freeman Dyson, 1979. So if you know the, the scientist Freeman Dyson, maybe you wouldn't be surprised that he would have this foresight, but he basically said that the question that will decide our destiny is not whether or not we go to space, um, it shall be, will we go as one species or a million? Uh, a million species will not exhaust the ecological niches that will be awaiting for us when we arrive. And um, maybe that's a little hint at synthetic biology and some of these other design principles, but that's the idea, is that we can, we'll go to Mars as Martians. Okay, thank you.
Beautiful. Thank you. We, uh, we think a lot at Autodesk about the future of making things, and uh, that is certainly something that's in that category. And I think it's exciting to know that a, a group of, what, 50 people down in Mountain View at NASA Ames, uh, a startup uh, is what they are, are in fact uh, doing this kind of stuff. And uh, I love the fact that one of your subcontractors on your project for, building, for designing and building large-scale manufacturing things in space Keep in mind, there are 50 people at Made in Space. They're a startup. One of their subcontractors, 24 people? I thought you had more than that. Okay, 24 people. But you need some engineers. I, I, I know you're hiring, because I've received three emails in the last two weeks saying, you know any good engineers? So one of their subcontractors is the $24 billion company, Northrop Grumman. This is a new world of space that we're talking about when things like that happen. Okay, up next. Um, Let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about the oceans, another place that there's plenty of uh, room for exploration in. Uh, so little of our oceans have ever uh, been explored. Um, you know, uh, two guys back in 1960 went to the bottom of the ocean, the deepest part of the ocean. In 1960 technology, they went to the bottom of the ocean. These two guys, guys Jacques Picard and uh, Don Walsh, um, and they made it back up alive after doing that. Uh, only, uh, only one other person has done that since then, and that was Jim Cameron in 2012 technology, uh, that he did it. So, um, so nobody's been down there, and most of our ocean hasn't been explored. And the reality is if we count on things like the US Navy who sent that submarine I just showed you uh, down, and if we rely on governments to do it, it's never going to get done. There's only one way we are going to be able to do the ocean exploration, that's necessary. And that's uh, in large part to the way that uh, my good friend, very good friend, David Lang is thinking about it. And he's gonna come up and share a little bit about you right with you right now about how we are going to do that. Uh, David, come on up and talk to these people. Welcome David Lang. Thanks, David. Good evening. Uh, I'm really honored to be here, and I love the way that Jonathan started this out, talking about all of these new frontiers, all of these new tools, and to me, the most important one are all of these new explorers. So I have a disclaimer, I am not a scientist, I'm not an engineer, and when this whole story got started five years ago, I was working at an office job and just writing a lot of emails. Maybe some people can relate to that. Um, but the, the, story, the story starts um, like a lot of good ones do. That's a really good that's ring. I, that's <laughs> that's a, excellent. So um, our story starts five years ago, and it was uh, my friend Eric Stackpole. I met this guy who told me this really outrageous story of a underwater cave that was supposedly filled with gold that no one had been able to get to the bottom of. And there were stories of uh, this robbery and all of these treasure hunters and scuba divers who had gone and tried to find the, the gold, but no one had been to the bottom of the cave. And Eric had this big idea. He was going to create an underwater robot to go explore. And this captivated me. I wanted to be involved. I said, Eric, I'm going to do whatever I can. We're going to find that gold. Big problem. We didn't know what we were doing. So. Um, <laughs> We did what anybody does at that point. We asked the internet for help. And so we created this website called Open Explorer, and we just started sharing our designs. We created a forum and said, does anyone have any ideas about how we could improve this initial prototype that we had created? We need this thing to work. And for many months, it was just me and Eric on the forums, me asking him questions about buoyancy and physics. And slowly, we, we got more people. We got more feedback. We started to get hints of something that might work. So I'm going to back up a little bit and just tell you what an underwater robot, an ROV, uh, actually is. So basically, it's an underwater drone. It's got a camera. It's got thrusters. You can drive it around. It's got lights on it. Uh, and you can control it from the surface. So you can actually see what the robot sees. And so that's what we were after. That's what we were trying to create. And eventually, we got to the point where the prototype was good enough to go back to the cave. And we did. We took it to the cave. And we put it down to this deep hole that you couldn't see the bottom of. And we didn't find any gold. <laughs> but um, we did have a lot of fun 
And we attracted a lot of attention. And all these people who had kind of been following along with this ride thought, you know, that's pretty cool. I would like one of these underwater robots for myself. So then we also do what you do. You put that project on Kickstarter. And so this was three years ago. So we raised $100,000 on Kickstarter three years ago, which back then was a huge amount of money. We were so excited. Um, but then we realized, oh my god, we're going to make all these things. And so we had all these parts and kits that we started ordering, and our garage filled up. And pretty soon, we realized we had to, to grow this small garage operation. We eventually got all these things shipped out. And over the past few years, we've shipped these things all over the world, to Florida, to the underwater reef base, to, for, to scuba divers, to cenotes, to Antarctica. Uh, this is some silky sharks in Cuba. Um, They've gone all over the world, 50 countries. We've shipped, I think, 2,500 of these things. So quite a few, from two guys in a garage to this global community of people who are curious and are passionate and are exploring this underwater world together. So that's a pretty big deal. You know, this is opening up a new window uh, onto our world. And I think I, when I stop and think about that, when I tell that story, it's actually still amazing to me. Still, like, I get this twinge of excitement. But, you know, the best part about it is that we're not alone. We're actually just a small sliver of this much bigger story that Jonathan's been talking about, about these new tools. So this is our, the, well, excuse me, this is our newest underwater robot. This is the, the open ROV Trident. This one, is, we came out with it in October, and it flies. I mean, this thing is not like a traditional submarine. This thing really moves. So we have come a real long way. Like I said, this is just a small sliver of a much bigger story. So this is our neighbor over in Berkeley. This is Chris Anderson. Uh, some of you may know him. In 2009, he started flying these remote-operated um, planes with his kids in his backyard and started to figure out if he could add Lego Mindstorms to these planes and create an autopilot. He started a website like we did and called it DIY Drones and got all of these people to contribute. Now there are over 75,000 members, and they're creating really cool, amazing technologies. This is their latest, the Solo drone. But these drones are being used for conservation. They're being used by people to ask really interesting questions. So this is actually that same garage that Eric and I got started in. Eric's roommates had some other ideas. They thought, maybe we could use all of these small, cheap smart co smartphone components and build satellites. And that's exactly what they did. And when, when Jonathan was talking about Planet Labs getting images, every location on Earth, every day. Those were people working in the garage right next door to us. Same garage. That's pretty amazing that we're living in this time where you can have this idea uh, and bring it to life. So you know, we talked about the drones for conservation. We talked about the satellites. There are now microscopes that cost 50 cents, these origami microscopes, a really extraordinary tool that's being sent all over the world to all sorts of people. There's DIY Geiger counters build, you know, being built to measure radiation. There's all of this new DIY bio equipment. People are building these tools that are orders of magnitude cheaper than the science and exploration tools have traditionally costed. And that's a really big deal. And I don't think that's a big deal because great scientists are going to save some money. That is, that's great. I'm happy about that. But I think what this is really pointing towards is this future where more people get to get involved. If you have a question that the barriers are not huge, you don't have to have a university affiliation or a grant from the NSF, you can just go out, get some friends together, and answer that question. And we're starting to see some of the importance. So I want to tell you one quick story from our community. This is Laura James. Laura is a diver and an ROV builder. She lives in the Puget Sound, or she lives in Seattle and just absolutely loves the Puget Sound. And I think a few years ago now, Laura started to notice that the sea stars in her area were, were starting to struggle. And she brought that to the attention of scientists and started sharing uh, the video and, and her findings with them. And they, she, you know, they, they didn't know what was going on. So what Laura did was she organized this citizen science project. She got people, everyone with a cell phone, everyone with an ROV, every diver, to collect their sightings and then contribute that data to ongoing research. So they eventually figured it out, the, the scientists, and with, with all this data, they, they figured out that it was a virus. And so that was what was going on with the sea stars. But this engagement remained. And the way that they covered the story was that it was this project that everyone in the community was, was focused on. And it got congressmen to introduce marine emergency disease acts 
to, to Congress, it's, it took on a life of its own, and that engagement remains, and now they're watching urchin populations. And so I think what these tools, what these stories, what these possibilities are pointing at is this world where we all get to ask questions. And so far, for me, I have been pleasantly and wonderfully surprised at what people not only discover, but these amazing questions that people have. So my question for you, and uh, I want to leave you with this, is what will you explore? Thank you. Pretty amazing stuff. You know, there are a handful of companies that make underwater drones, and they sell for hundreds of thousands of dollars each. Um, and uh, usually it's governments and others that buy them. I think it's true. We, we haven't actually figured this out, but I'm sure it's true that no single company has sold more underwater drones than Open ROV. Yeah, and I think that's phenomenal. There's something going on with this stuff, all this stuff that we're here talking about today. Just like the maker movement that we've heard about for over a decade now, maybe, there's something going on around citizen exploration and citizen science, and it's wonderful. And I firmly believe that it is the only way that we will be able to address all of the grand challenges that we face here on planet Earth, is if we could get every single mind we can to be contributing, using their brain power to help us think about exactly what it is we need to do. So, isn't it wonderful? I love this quote. I always have, the cure to boredom is curiosity. There is no cure for curiosity. The wonderful Dorothy Parker said that. Thank goodness that's true. Thank goodness that's true. Well, I hope you enjoyed hearing from uh, all of us tonight. Uh, was this a worthwhile use of your time to come in and sit down and listen to us for a little while? Thank you. Look, there's several people here that you can talk to if you're, if you're fired up about this and you want to learn more and do more. There's a few people here you can talk to. Uh, any of us tonight? Erica, right here you can talk to. She's part of the Open Explorer and Open ROV movement as well. And Brad is back here. Brad, wave your hand around. Brad is from Made in Space. There's others from Open ROV. Talk to each other, for heaven's sakes. And let's talk. Let's spend time together. Let's do the activities. Have fun. And do something meaningful. Thank you for joining us tonight. Before you go, keep in mind, Thursday, June 2nd is the design night. So no design night in May. Design night next is June 2nd, Thursday, June 2nd. And it is uh, food. Thank you, Grace. So design night food in June. Uh, thanks for coming and enjoy your evening, everybody. Take care. Good night.